I will worship you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion and tender care rest upon all his creatures. The Lord, the Lord is faithful in all his words, and gracious all his deeds. The Lord catches those who are stumbling. The Lord lifts up those who have been doubled by their burdens. The Lord is just in all his ways, and kind in all his doings. The Lord comes near to those who call upon him. The Lord hears the cry of those who are hurting. The Lord watches over all who love him. With, with my, my mouth, mouth I, will I will praise the Lord. Lord. With all, all my being, I will, I will praise the Lord. our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus you bore our sorrows. Love Wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him. Tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him. Ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Savior reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Our hand glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise We hear now these words of scripture from Exodus chapter number 2, verses 11 through 15. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. 
When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Almighty God, fill our mouths with words of praise and adoration, for you are our Savior and Redeemer. Fill our hearts with joy, for you have so wonderfully and mysteriously created us, so mercifully forgiven us, so graciously accepted us, so amazingly loved us, and so tenderly called us to be your children. Almighty God, accept the gift of our worship today. May it be pleasing to you as we offer you our praise, our gratitude, our devotion, and our love. Almighty God, may these moments of worship please you, and when it has ended, may we honor and glorify you by the lives we choose to live. We pray now the prayer Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We continue hearing from the Word of God in the book of Exodus, chapter number 2, verses 23 through chapter 3, verse 12. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. These are unprecedented times. In recent months, we have heard these words chosen to describe the days of our lives. It's hard to argue with these words. The entire world is caught up in a pandemic unlike anything we've seen for 100 years. The economic system threatens to collapse under a stress we've not witnessed since the Great Depression. The social unrest conjures up distant memories of the civil rights struggle and reminds us that racism has not died as we had hoped. These are unprecedented times. The good news is that humanity and the world has survived unprecedented times numerous times across history. The same could be said for faith in God and for the church. These are unprecedented times. We are unable to come together to worship God in the ways that have proven to be comforting, inspiring, and meaningful for us across time. We are, all, we are alone with our faith for the very first time. We are not with other believers to compare our lives of faith with their life of faith. The game of comparison is over. We are alone with God, our relationship with God in these times, and our trust in God for these times are being tested in an aloneness and in a solitude we did not choose, but was forced upon us by realities beyond our control. 
we are alone to determine how to live out our faith and our daily living. We can no longer comfort ourselves by identifying church attendance and participation in church events as evidence that we are living by faith. Our crutches have been taken away. The good news is this. God, faith, the church, and believers have endured unprecedented times countless times across history. On this Sunday, I'm not inclined to explore the unprecedented times the world and humanity are facing with a pandemic on stage and an economic and social crisis in the wings. I am inclined to talk about living, I talk about a living faith for these unprecedented times. A mature faith, because unprecedented times call for us to put away childish ways when it comes to developing a living faith. Alone, in isolation and solitude, we find ourselves wondering about God in these times. Where is God? What is God up to, if anything? In unprecedented times of faith like these, we wonder what it even means to be the people of faith. People who worship and trust God, people who obey and serve God. Unprecedented times for faith call for us to sit up a little higher, listen a little closer, read our sacred scriptures more intently, ask tougher questions that are begging to be recognized, weighed through the mystery that is God, and finally, to let God have his way with us. For many of us, our understanding of both God and faith was defined by the Bible stories we heard as children. Of course, we were not told the whole story, just the highlights of the stories, Highlights folks thought would inspire us to trust God with our lives. We were not told certain details that might make the characters appear more human, like us. Nor did we hear of their struggle to trust God, which might make faith more believable for us. We make ordinary people of faith superheroes of faith with superpowers we could never dream of. Two examples. We were told the inspiring story of Abraham and Sarah, who left their country and their kinspeople to go with God on a journey to a promised land. But we weren't told, told how afraid they could be and how Abraham could lie, telling folks Sarah was his sister, in hopes of saving his own neck and making her available to powerful men. We revel in the story of David and Goliath. A boy with a slingshot and a smooth stone takes down a giant. But we were not told of David's adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and the great cover-up that involved the murder of a dedicated military officer who happened to be the husband of his prey. When we encounter the whole story the Bible tells us of this life of faith, it is far more complex than we were told. The interaction between God and his people, even the ones we call heroes, is much more compl complicated than we could imagine. This is so because the Bible is far too revealing about the dynamics of the relationship between God and his people. We may not like what we encounter in the Bible, but this is the way God really works as he engages his world and his people. When we are faced with unprecedented times, we discover that we need more than the Bible stories of our childhood. We need to explore a relationship with God as complicated and complex as the stories really are in the Bible. In unprecedented times, we turn to the Bible for the rest of the story. As an example, 
I have chosen to look rather closely at the beginning of the book of Exodus this morning. A book that gives us one of our stellar heroes, Moses. A book that describes for us God at work in an unprecedented time. Hold on to your seat and join me as we venture where others have dared not go to the whole story, to all the facts, and to the known and the unknowables. At the beginning of Exodus, there is much we know about Moses, and yet there is so little we know about him. We know at the time of his birth, the king of Egypt had ordered all male Hebrew babies to be drowned in the Nile. We know that his mother and father hid him for three months after his birth and then hatched a plan in which the Pharaoh's daughter would find a little Hebrew baby in a basket floating on the Nile. And the Pharaoh's daughter names the little Hebrew baby Moses, for she drew him out of the water. The waters of the Nile, intended for his demise, ironically become his salvation. We have no clue what happens during those lost years of young Moses' life. Was he treated like the son of the Pharaoh's daughter? Did he grow up in the Pharaoh's palace? How and when did he learn that he was not an Egyptian, but a Hebrew? Was he allowed to see his real mother and father and sister? The first thing we do know about Moses after those lost years is that he murders an Egyptian who is beating a Hebrew kinsman and hides the body in the sand. He thinks he's gotten away with it until he attempts to intervene in a dispute between two Hebrew men, his own people, and discovers that his secret is out. The Hebrew who is striking the other Hebrew sarcastically responds to Moses, Who made you judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses fears for his life. The Pharaoh puts a reward on for his capture, dead or alive. Moses become a fugitive, running away from the Pharaoh's house to the land of Midian. Ironically, in running away from Pharaoh, Moses will run into God, but not for a long time. Again, there's a lot we do not know. Did Moses' father, mother, and sister keep him connected to his Hebrew roots? How did he become aware of the oppression his kinfolks were enduring? What happened to inspire him to take the side of the Hebrews? Having grown up in the palace, did he have visions of leading the Israelites to freedom? Having heard stories of Joseph, did he aspire to be a great hero like Joseph for his people? But the most perplexing aspect of the beginning of the story of Moses and the liberation of God's chosen people is the absence of God. There rises to power a king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and there is no mention of God. This king oppresses the Hebrews, and they become forced labor for his empire, and there is no mention of God. This new king orders the Hebrew midwives to kill each male Hebrew boy at at birth. There is no mention of God. The king orders for every boy born to Hebrews to be tossed in the Nile to drown. And there is no mention of God. This one Hebrew baby boy, who, who will be named Moses, is saved from the Nile by the king's daughter. And there is no mention of God. Moses grows up into a young man, murders an Egyptian, becomes a fugitive from justice. And once again, there is no mention of 
God. We have to read a couple of pages into Exodus before God appears. There we read, After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. There was a long time between Moses becoming a fugitive and the king of Egypt dying. For a long time, Moses was only a shepherd following his father-in-law's sheep on the backside of Horeb in the desert. It was a long time before God heard the groaning of his people, remembered the covenant he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and paused to take notice of his Hebrew children suffering in Egypt. Again, there is much we don't know. What was Moses thinking all those years he was a fugitive? What was God doing all those years he was silent? Had Moses continued to recall the suffering of his people in Egypt? Where has God been while his chosen people have been groaning under the oppression of the king of Egypt? Where was God when his people were mourning the deaths of their baby boys? Why must God remember his covenant? Doesn't God know everything? Why does God choose this time to take notice of his people's suffering? Well, we don't know any of those things, but we do know this. When God decides to act, Moses is alone in the wilderness. In God's time, and not in Moses' time, They meet God and Moses on the backside of Mount Horeb in a bush that burns but is not consumed. And for the first time in the book of Exodus, God speaks, Moses, Moses. And Moses replies, here am I. God warns, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet. This is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses is terrified and hides his face. He is afraid to dare to look at the face of God. And now, God is silent no longer. Moses will no longer be on the run. Moses will now stand for God in the presence of the Pharaoh. He will lead God's people, his kindred, out of Egypt to a good land. Moses is no longer alone, for God will be with him. The future? Well, we leave that to God and to his reluctant, stammering servant Moses. For God does not begin something without finishing it. But this we do know. God has chosen to set his people free. I offer you this full story of God and Moses, of aloneness and solitude, as we wait to see what God will do. For I believe this time is our time to be alone, like Moses was alone. We are alone with ourselves, alone with our dreams and aspirations, alone with our disappointments and regrets, alone and nostalgic for the times before this unprecedented time, alone with our faith, which may or may not have the power to see us through these unprecedented times. I offer this story because from the beginning, God has been hovering over chaos at creation when it all began, and as his people suffered in Egypt, 
And he is no doubt looking over the chaos of our world and our lives in this unprecedented time in which we are living. We may feel isolated, alone, and fearful of God's absence, but we must remember, even when God does not speak, he is listening to the groaning of his people. We do not know how we will make it through these unprecedented times alone. But God has not relinquished his world to the powers presently at play. We need to fear only God, not the times in which we are living. I offer this full story for whatever the future holds. I don't expect us to be called to sit in a pew, to stand and sing familiar hymns, and to simply go home after the benediction. But we will be called to become co-conspirators with God in shaping our present chaos into something that looks more like the kingdom of God. If we do not listen to the full story, we diminish God and we render ourselves incapable of becoming co-conspirators with God in the saving and redeeming of God's world, our world through both the strength and the weakness of love. God finds Moses, a shepherd in the wilderness. Moses finds God in a burning bush. God calls Moses. Moses goes after God. Together, they lead God's people to freedom. They are co-conspirators against the Pharaoh. Together, they are liberators of God's people. It may, in a way we may never understand, Moses had to be alone, and God had to be away. For this unprecedented time to become a time of freedom and liberation. I believe this is where we are now. We will not be able to go back to a faith that was once so comforting to us. I do not believe God will ever again allow us to lasso him, corral him, break him, and stable him in our sanctuaries. No, God will step out of the church into the chaos. God will call men and women like you and me to refuse to allow the words we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, to be merely wishful thinking, but a call to action as we embrace the chaos with the visions of God's kingdom inspiring us to work and to sacrifice. I am not comfortable with this time that we are now living there is not enough new light for me to see the path ahead. Yet of this I am confident. God has not brought us this far to turn around and go back to where we were before this unprecedented time. I am not comfortable thinking that God is about to do something new as Isaiah warned the people in ex exile so many centuries ago. For I do not know what this new may require of me. I am not comfortable with what may await us when God makes all things new, as the writer of the Revelation forewarns us, because I am too comfortable with the old. Whatever God is attempting to do with the chaos and with us, in these unprecedented times is complex and complicated. For it to be anything else, God would not be God, and we, his children, would not be his full partners in his saving and redeeming, reconciling and restoring work. The prospect of God doing something new may not sound comforting to us, 
as we sit alone and isolated from the chaos swirling around us in this time. But let us remember, Jesus is. Jesus is blazing the trail before us. On our way to this new thing God is doing in the midst of the chaos with only people like you and me as his co-conspirators, we only have to follow him. Somehow these stories are always an ending. This story may end for us as it did for Moses, gazing onto God's new future while breathing our last breath. But the breath we breathe deeply will be the assurance that God is where he has always been, right there with us. Someday, perhaps the presence of God will be enough for us, and we will emerge from the crucible of our solitude to dream new dreams and to see new visions. New dreams and new visions God inspires as God subdues the chaos of unprecedented times and transforms them into the kingdom. These may be unprecedented times, but God has seen them before. And God waits for ordinary men and women like us to join him in making his world new. Are, are we ready? Amen. Receive now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord watch over your going and coming. May the Lord bless you with peace in troubled times, with comfort in times of sorrow, and with sustaining grace when suffering comes your way. May the Lord inspire you to speak the truth in love, to do something good each day, to share generously with others, and to look for him among the least of our brothers and sisters. May the Lord lead you along the narrow way to a deeper and richer life, joyful and abundant. Amen.